I think one of the things that we found that was most surprising was that the traditional practice of most teachers is to give some kind of grade or score and some kind of comment. And the assumption has always been that giving a grade and a comment gives you the best of both worlds, that somehow the two will reinforce each other. And what the research that we've studied and stuff that we've done ourselves seems to indicate is that actually giving both a grade and a comment gives you the worst of both worlds. The students who get the, the high scores don't need to read the comments and the students who get the low scores don't want to read the comments. So one of the things that we've tried to do is to help teachers reduce the salience of grading and scoring in their classrooms. That's not to say we can get rid of grading entirely. Obviously students need to know where they are at some point. But we suggest that teachers should grade far less frequently than they do. They should actually grade at the end of a piece of learning rather than during the, the learning. And uh, during the learning, the feedback should focus on how students can improve rather than where they are right now. One of the problems that we've created is that we've actually set up a situation in which students work only because they're going to get a grade or a score for something. And that's definitely a problem because we've created the situation. But our experience is that we can actually work on helping students focus on a longer term goal. Ultimately, it's still about getting the students the best possible grade they can, but it's about making the criteria for success transparent. One of the switches we're trying to help teachers make is in the students' minds from she gave me a C to I got a C. She gave me a C is indicative of an attitude that the grade you get depends on whether the teacher likes you or not. And one of the switches we found very powerful is that when teachers manage to communicate to students the success criteria, what it, what it means to get an A or a B, the students don't say she gave me a C. The students say I got a C because I didn't meet the criteria for getting a B or an A. And the important thing then is that the students can be supported in working towards those standards. So we actually help students work towards grades, but we actually support them in doing, in doing that. The idea is that they should work towards a grade rather than just be given a grade on everything they do in, by way of preparation. Can I give you another example? Sure. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're a track and field coach, if you're a track coach, and you really want to get your athletes to be able to break the 100, uh, break the 100 meters barrier of, say, 10 seconds, the, the way you do that is not to get every athlete to run lots and lots of 100 meter sprints. You do a whole range of activities. You build up to a big sporting uh, event or a track meet, and you then get your athletes to put, put everything together in one big performance. And what we're doing currently is, in our math and our science classrooms, is we're getting students just to run loads and loads of 100 yards, 100 meter sprints. And that doesn't actually produce the best learning because the students who are not making a lot of progress get, get disheartened and give up. It would be far better off reducing the salience of grading in the day-to-day -day classroom practice of most teachers. One of the things that we found is that as teachers begin to work in this way, as they begin to use or to unlock the power of assessment in supportive instruction, that students become more motivated because part of the process, as I said earlier, is communicating the success criteria to students. So students can see what the goals are and the grading process becomes less mysterious. They know what they have to do. And so it almost seems more, it almost as if it's more empowering that I can actually aim for this and maybe have a chance of getting there. If the success criteria are, are, are uh, unclear or, or secret, then Grading just seems like this capricious process of which students have no control. And when students feel in control, they actually try, try harder. The other thing is that we've been very surprised by is just how powerful assessment for learning can be in raising student achievement. I've always been a big advocate of the idea that the only worthwhile education and interventions are those that increase student achievement. I don't care about actually making teachers happier unless it also translates into increasing student achievement. And the thing that we were quite surprised by, both in the original research review that Paul Black and I did, and in the work we've sub so subsequently done with teachers, the thing that surprised us most was that if all you care about is boosting your test scores, you don't care about making nice citizens, you don't care about quality of learning, if all you care about is boosting your test scores, then improving the quality of day-to-day -day classroom assessment is probably your best way of going about that. Because what you're doing by doing genuine assessment for learning is by making your, your teaching more responsive to the 
the learning of the students. So it's about making teaching more agile, rather than waiting until the end of an instructional sequence to find out if students have learned something, as we usually do, you actually pick up information while the students are still in front of you and while you have still have time to do something about it. And so, in a way, it's perhaps not surprising that we see these impacts on student learning, but it's still very hard to help teachers to do this because most teachers have ingrained ha habits that, that are not uh, well aligned to these practices. And, of course, Teaching is a very habitual activity. You get good at it by practicing these things a lot. And so asking teachers to change their practice is, is very difficult. It's almost like asking a golfer to change their swing during a tournament. We don't give teachers six months to go away and practice this stuff in front of a mirror and then try it out with real kids. We expect them to do it from day one. And so one of the things that we always advocate is that the change needs to be slow because teachers need to be in control of this change process. I don't think I can tell teachers what to do. I can't tell them which of these things will work for their classrooms. What I can do is say that these are techniques that are, a large number of teachers have found effective, and if they work for you, then carry on using them and consolidate them. If they don't work for you, try something else, and just keep on trying to innovate in this area around making your instruction more adaptive to the responses of the students. In the same way that we can't tell teachers what to do in their classrooms because we don't know what will work, I can't say to a district what will work and what won't. What we have found is that frequently teachers need dispensation or, or a waiver from certain requirements of the school. And so one district I was working with, the, the teacher, a uh, grade three teacher this was, she realized that the interim grades that the school policy required her to give on her students was getting in the way of her doing um, effective assessment for learning. So she went to the principal and, and said, can we do without uh, interim grades? Can we just have comments for interim grades um, while we try this experiment out? And the principal was very supportive. What's really interesting is that now the principal's invited me back and wants me to talk to all the rest of the teachers in the school because it's been so successful. So there are things that we need to, sometimes to adjust in order to make this stuff work. Uh, it is scary. There is no doubt. Teachers say to me all the time, you're asking us to give up control. You're asking us to, to, to let go of our classrooms. And there's no doubt that this is very scary for a lot of teachers. Ultimately, I can't prove to a teacher that this will work. What we have found is that most teachers find something in this range of um, strategies and techniques that actually works for them and that can actually begin them on the process of, de of developing their practice um, in these fruitful directions. One of the things that people always raise with us when we introduce these ideas is what will the parents say? And there is no doubt that parents use regular grading as a way of checking up that the school is doing its job. So if you stop grading and change the kind of feedback without telling parents what's going on, obviously parents are going to get concerned. So we always advise schools to mount an information campaign, have a back to school evening, explain to the parents how the, ref the feedback this year is going to be different from the way it was last year. Uh, the surprising thing is we found that parents are almost uniformly positive about this. We had parents saying things like, when, when you gave my daughter a C, I had no idea how to help. But when you give feedback in terms of comments and targets that she needs to work towards, I can actually get more productively involved in my child's schooling. So provided they have these things explained to them, uh, our experience is that parents are very supportive. And, you know, at the end of the marking period, the, the, the kids who used to get the A's still get the A's. Um, some kids still get the B's and C's. But the point is that those grades are higher than they would have been had you been given, giving kids grades right through the marking period. And it took us a long time to come up with a good answer. But, and the best we managed to come up with so far is good feedback causes thinking. It's as simple as that. I always ask teachers, how many of you believe that your students take as long taking on board the feedback you give them as it took you to produce it. And not one teacher believes that. Students just take one look at the feedback and they just ignore it. What we're saying to teachers is give less feedback, but make students accountable for doing something with it. So, the, so that the really powerful feedback is that which causes the students to engage cognitively with that feedback. Not emotionally, but cognitively. Um, 
And that unlocks a whole range of possibilities. And one of the things the math teacher said to us was, OK, it's all very well saying don't, don't give grades, give, give comments. But if I give students 20 exercises to do and they get 15 of them correct, I check 15 of them and put a cross next to five of them, they can work out for themselves they got 15 out of 20, um, even if we don't tell them that. So we said to these teachers, well, why don't you just tell the students that five of these are incorrect and you find them and you fix them? The idea is that feedback should always leave something for the students to do, and the teacher should put in place systems for making sure that the students do engage with that. And, and then teachers are spending less time banging their heads against a brick wall. The grading, grading is just a hugely wasteful activity, the way it's practiced in most schools. I worked out that the annual amount of money spent on grading in K-12 across the United States is about $20 billion a year and most of it has no impact on students' learning, but keeps parents happy. Possibly the most expensive public relations exercise in history. So what we need to do is to do less grading, do it differently, but make sure that the students then do something with it. One of our colleagues summed up what we've been trying to do as making the students' voices louder and making the teachers' hearing better. So the thing that I say to teachers is you need to open up the communication channels between you and your students. Your students know when they're learning and when they're not. But those channels of communication are not open. So there are a whole range of things you can do. One student, well, sorry, one teacher, what she does, is she has every student in the class has a disc, green on one side, red on the other. When the lesson starts, the green side of the disc is showing. If a kid doesn't understand something, they just flip the disc over to red. If only one student is showing red, perhaps the teacher moves on and tries to help that student individually. If six or seven students are showing red, the teacher might slow down, go back over what they've just covered, and maybe ask some other students who are showing green about their understanding of this. What we found is that students who have never asked a question all year in class will flip the disc to red just to show that they're, they're their understanding is, is, is falling behind. So it's about opening up those channels, channels of communication. And what's wonderful for me in my work with teachers is the way that teachers keep on coming up with new ways to open up these channels of communication between students and learners so that you're repositioning the teacher as, um, as being the ally of the student rather than the enemy. I dislike the word facilitator because that suggests that teachers can t take an approach of anything goes. The teacher has a, a critical responsibility in terms of engineering these situations which students learn. But there are, there are many ways in, in which teachers can do this. The important thing is for them to experiment and try th what works for them. For administrators, I think the message is slightly different. Most under administrators are under pressure to improve test scores. So the first question I ask them is, what else are you going to do? You're going to get your teachers to teach more aggressively? Teachers are working as hard as they can now. There's no spare capacity in the system. So the thing that I would do if I, was an if I was talking to administrators would be to advise them to set up a group of teachers who really w want to do this stuff. Don't try and take everybody with you in the first go because there'll be too much resistance. People will say it won't work with our kids, it won't work with our curriculum, our curriculum is too full. So what you need is to take some teachers who are willing to experiment with this, get those uh, existence proofs, if you like, in the school, the fact that it can work with our students, it can work with our curriculum and then the uptake for other teachers will be quicker. And then the other thing to do is to think about whether there's any aspects of school policy that are getting in the way of this, and if necessary, grant people temporary waivers from these aspects of school policy so that they can actually do this experimentation. I think parents are right to be concerned about changes, and therefore you have to start from a respect for those concerns. Parents almost always have the, the interest of their children at heart. So any changes are threatening if they think that, that this means that their students won't achieve as highly, um, it won't, won't be as successful, won't enjoy school as much. So I think that the important thing is to, is, is to create situations in which you can communicate with parents and create situations in which parents can raise those concerns. So get those concerns out on the table. Have um, back to school evenings, have, te have teachers presenting the proposed changes, and then make a genuine attempt to elicit any concerns that parents might have. The really important approach 
uh, aspect of our approach that, that I always go, uh, go on about is that we think that change can be incremental and radical at the same time. Because most teachers have got so much invested in how they teach right now that there is absolutely no way they could tear up what they do and teach in a different way. It's a matter of working with what you have and changing these, these kinds of dynamics in the classroom. But what, the other thing that assessment for learning does yield, which we were quite surprised by, are what we call high leverage strategies. These things that are very small changes in the classroom that result in quite massive changes in the classroom environment. So one of them, for example, is just as simple as no hands up except to ask a question. So the rule is that if a teacher asks a question, the students do not raise their hands. The teacher decides who gets to answer the question. And this has changed classrooms more radically than anything else we've seen because all of a sudden, you can't signal your lack of participation by not raising your hand. Anybody in the classroom can get asked a question. Teachers still find themselves asking the students who might know the answer. So some students, some, some teachers, have randomized their questioning by writing all the students' names on popsicle sticks and choosing them at random out of a cup. In those classrooms, the students are really concentrating because they might be the one who, who's called on to answer. And teachers have made a game of this by softening the impact somewhat so that if you're worried about picking on students who aren't able to answer, you can always offer them options like um, do you want to play or pass? You can, any kid can have two passes per lesson or whatever. You can actually offer the kids 50-50 or phone a friend and make it into a bit more uh, exciting in that way. But what's really interesting is that some things as ubiquitous as having students raise their hands in classrooms. You know, it's as natural to us as the water is to the goldfish. We don't even see it anymore. And yet it is hugely damaging because it allows some students to signal their non-participation. It allows some students to turn off and not even have to think. And what I want to help teachers create are these high engagement classrooms where there's accountability for the teacher, there's accountability for the students. That Everybody has to be focused on the work in this classroom. Um, and then also building in peer support so that students are helping each other as well.